Tonight, we look at the story that has been told about the murder of John Benet Ramsey and why so many think her parents guilty and what this tells us about the America she so briefly lived in. The question isn't, has John Benet's America changed since that Christmas in 1996? But how much has America changed? Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. So one way that we deal with this issue of how much has America changed in 26 years since the John Benet Ramsey case? Well, one way of looking at that is how the story changed. How much the story about the events going into the John Bonet Ramsey case, they've changed so much, just that, that it is an analogy for how much we have changed, how much we are changing, how much our story is changing. Nevertheless, we are now going to look at the number one clue in the John Bonet Ramsey case that we've all missed. How did Mr. Ramsey's story change? And in order to deal with that question, we're going to look at this comment from an HLN interview raising this. And it was something that I saw on Cotton Star Crime Scene's Instagram page. I'll put a link to that in the description. Was the story changed? The story changed, Fred. When Mr. Ramsey said, what happened that night? They read his child a book and put him to sleep just like you're supposed to do. And then the story changed. How important? I think any change in the story is... Yes, any change in the story is important. But before we get to that, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do. Like, share, leave a comment, and let's get started. Now, in the HLN clip, Chris Cuomo asks Fred Patterson, the Boulder PD officer who chaperoned John Bonet's brother Burke to the White residence on the day after Christmas, How important is it? How important is it that the story changed? As I say, I saw this clip on Cotton Star Crime Scene's Instagram page. Let's have a look at how John Bonet's father's account evolved in terms of the bedtime story narrative. Number one, the first source that John Ramsey read John Bonet a bedtime story comes from the first responding officer, Rick French. Interestingly, this first account placed John Bonet with Burke and both kids awake until as late as 10.30 p.m. on Christmas night. Curiously, in the paragraph dealing with the bedtime story, French has to clarify that John Bonet and Burke's bedrooms are separate. Rick French records the information as, quote, Gathering information from Mr. and Mrs. Ramsey, They told me, and that is presumably Patsy and John, providing a simultaneous account, followed by John said. Officer Rick French's report was written at 1300 hours or 1 p.m. on December 26th, on the same day, fairly close to the time that the alleged statements were made. Do you think he got them wrong? Number two. The second source is easy to assume as corroboration of the first source, But unfortunately, it could also be a derivative of French's statement, compiled by Detective Linda Arndt. Instead of Arndt confirming this aspect of the Ramsey's account directly from them, she appears to have gotten information from French instead. Arndt writes, quote, John Bonet and her brother Burke went to bed shortly after the family returned home. As you would expect, there is already a deviation here from French's statement in that John Bonet's brother Burke is now no longer part of the bedtime story element. However, it does repeat the notion that John Bonet was awake. Number three, the third version. That came out several months later at the end of April 1997, by which time the Ramses had lawyered up and Team Ramsey, as Detective Steve Thomas referred to the Army of Ramsey Reinforcement, was a thing. John told Detective Thomas what time they had arrived home, which had shifted to a spectrum 8.30 to 9.15 
instead of 10 p.m. And of course, now John Bonet was asleep and there was no bedtime story. John could also not recall what time John Bonet had gone to sleep, but he said all lights were out at 10.30 p.m. When Steve Thomas asked him, so you can't recall with any certainty what John Bonet went to sleep in that night, he responded, no. Also, interestingly, John indicates here that he went right upstairs to bed and that the lights went out at 10.30 or 10.40 p.m. Something else to note is that instead of dealing with putting John Bonet to bed, in this version, he puts Burke to bed between 9.30 and 10. He says probably a quarter to 10. And then he goes directly upstairs to bed from that point. Now let's deal with the fourth version. This was to the police in June 1998. It was John Ramsey's police statement. And reading a book is back, but this time it's John reading to himself. In this version, he's surprised John Bonet is so sound asleep. Lou Smith says to John, Now you go home after leaving the Steins. To your knowledge, John Bonet is asleep in the back seat, and she's directly behind you? John Ramsey, uh-huh, Lou Smith, you pull into the garage and just let me, we're kind of going slower through this. How do you get into the garage? I mean, does it, John Ramsey interrupts, he says, we have a garage open in the car and as I recall, I think I parked on the right side of the garage. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was the right side. And the kind of routine was Burke, but John Bonnet was sound asleep. In fact, I was surprised at how she was because I picked her up or tried to pick her up and she was just really out because I kind of struggled a bit to get her in my arms. Then later on he said, I just remember thinking, boy, she's really out. Later on in that same statement, John Ramsey says, just in my medicine or in my sink or in the drawer because I wanted to get to sleep right away to sleep well because I knew I had to get up the next morning early. And I might have read for a few minutes. I think I did. It was probably 10-ish or something in that range. At this point, notice how difficult it is to stay on track just trying to find out what happened within the narrow confines that deal with this idea of bedtime stories. I believe John Ramsey said something to the effect that he read a book and that Officer French misunderstood that and took it to mean that he read to his children. I can't seem to find the source for that now, though, unfortunately. If you do, if you know of that source, please leave it in the comments. Now let's go on to number five. We get a fifth version of the tucking John Bonet into bed aspect in the Ramsey's own book, Death of Innocence. In Death of Innocence, which was published around 2000, John is once again amazed at how sound asleep John Bonet is. In this version, John plays with Burke and tucks Burke into bed, and the final timestamp given is 9.30 p.m. Here, John also mentions reading in bed for a while. I should also mention that somewhere in one of the interviews, I think it's the second one that Patsy Ramsey gives, she refers to John Bonet as being zonked out. Now let's go on to number six. In the sixth version, which appeared in Lauren Schiller's book, Perfect Murder, Perfect Town, and then again in the Lifetime movie, Patsy sings a lullaby over her daughter. This is a quote from his book. During a conversation between John Ramsey and Detective Arndt on the morning of December 26, Ramsey said that the family arrived home at about 10 p.m., Christmas night. Ramsey parked their Jeep Cherokee next to their Jaguar in the garage, he said. According to a police report, he carried John Bonet, who was still asleep, upstairs to her room where he took her shoes off and read to her. Patsy undressed her, remembered singing a bedtime song to her while she slept, and kissed her goodnight. And here's an excerpt from the Columbus Dispatch reviewing the Lifetime movie in 2016, on the 20th anniversary, which was based on Schiller's book. Quote, In what is possibly one of the more exploitative creative decisions in film history, Who Killed John Bonet is narrated by a disembodied child voice representing the ghost of John Bonet. 
The film opens on home videos with Lipinski's narration, which includes her whispering the child's bedtime prayer. As I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to die. That's the last thing I remember, saying those words, and I fell asleep. I don't remember anything after that. After that version comes number seven, the seventh version where Patsy talks about singing or thinking about praying over John Bonet. She said, I remember we used to always say a prayer that I learned when I was growing up. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. And uh, I remember praying that over her that night as I tucked her in. Here's the opposite part from the original transcript from NBC. And I think this is around 2000. Mr. Ramsey says, nine-ish probably. Patsy says, John Bonet had fallen asleep. She had fallen asleep in the back of the car by the time we got home. Katie Couric said, did she ever wake up? Tell me what happened when she got home. Patsy says, we put her to... John carried her up to bed and then I, you know, kind of got her undressed and pulled her pajama pants on. They were kind of long underwear pants that were in a pajama drawer. She was sound asleep, tucked her in bed, kissed her goodnight, said the prayers and Kurik, you said your prayers, Patsy. I said my prayers over her and tucked her in bed. That's seven, that's enough. So what you have here is a snapshot of the Ramsey case through the keyhole of just one door. Did John read a bedtime story to John Bonet? You can see over the years that it turns out to be quite a difficult question with quite a difficult answer. But if we had to simplify that answer, I think the answer is no. John didn't read a bedtime story to John Bonet before she died. He did read a bedtime story to himself. Now, if we could turn back time, how could we fine-tune this aspect of the investigation? Well, firstly, you could ask, what was the bedtime storybook you read from? And did you read the whole book or just several pages? And then you would want to find the book and examine it for DNA, fingerprints, fibers, etc. The same applies to the book John said that he read before he went to bed in his own bedroom. Identify the book. Be specific. While we are caught up trying to move between the thickets of trees and branches and weeds springing up in the Ramsey case, and in 26 years those thickets are undoubtedly dense and bewildering, the more pertinent question may not be whether John read a bedtime story, or whether Patsy sang a lullaby, or whether John Bonet was awake or asleep, or whether Burke was somewhere playing with a particular toy. The more pertinent question when you think about a father's last moments with his daughter or a mother's last moments with her daughter is the psychological woods of the story. Whether the daughter and her brother experienced both parents as loving, caring and affectionate. Well, what did the grand jury say about that? What did the housekeeper say about how affectionate she perceived the parents to be. What did John Bonet's photographer say about the affection she saw or didn't see? And if she didn't see affection, what did she see? The bedtime stories to John Bonet and Burke and the bedtime story just to John Bonet and the lullaby and the prayer are all inconsistent descriptions of loving parents by the parents themselves. Do you see the inconsistencies in these descriptions or a description in and of itself? But nevertheless, the story we are told by hook or by crook is of a loving household one Christmas in Boulder. It's a story where the night ends in a fairy tale of family happiness, only for the next morning to break out and plunge the family into a nightmare. But is the fairy tale really real? The real psychological woods here is the question behind all these questions. It's whether this was a loving family. The mother is no longer here to tell us. The daughter is no longer here to tell us. 
and the sun is one of the most secretive people associated with the most famous and perhaps most high profile true crime case of all. You may think that Ali wanting to know about John and Patsy putting John Bonnet and Burke to bed is otherwise incidental, but what's really going on behind the scenes is an attempt to track down clothing fibers. Remember, if John Bonnet is being undressed and dressed, then this explains why certain clothing fibers are in John Bonnet's clothing. This could have happened innocently, such as putting a child to bed, but it could also be an explanation for how fibers came to be where they were during potential staging. Although both John and Patsy were adamant that they put John Bonnet to bed and that she and they slept soundly, we know John Bonnet went down to the kitchen at some point after dinner with the whites and ate pineapple. This is clear from the autopsy evidence and from photos of the bowl and spoon with pineapple inside. We also know that Burke later said that he snuck downstairs when everyone thought he was sleeping. So, if nothing else, we know even if John and Patsy were 100% sure that they knew what happened that night, it appears they didn't know something. If you think about the complexity and intrigue regarding the simple question whether or not there was a bedtime story, a lullaby or a prayer, compare that concept, the semantic complexity, compare the woods of that aspect, the psychological woods, to the psychological and semantic woods of the ransom note. It goes on forever and ever. It goes on and on and never really takes you anywhere or tells you anything. No one takes it seriously either. It becomes an essential clue pointing to nowhere but more trees. And isn't that what the ransom note was supposed to do? John Bonnet is missing. Quick, let's look at this ransom note and then not really look at it. In the same way, you can look at the face of John Bonnet Ramsey and ask, who was she really? In reality, none of the pictures we see of John Bonnet is John Bonnet. Take away the pageantry, the makeup, the hairdo, the distracting mesh of color and appearance, and you have a little schoolgirl made to look like a princess. If you want to find out what happened to John Bonnet, you have to do the same thing. Get rid of the distractions, the false narratives, and all the pageantry. In the same way that we almost never see the real John Bonnet, we almost never get to the real story either. We're too caught up in the details, in wandering under the fading trees, to see the woods for what they are, and the world for what it is. A final footnote on this particular topic. Detective Steve Thomas suggests on page 25 of his book that John Ramsey did confirm directly to Arndt that he had read to John Bonnet after tucking her in. But it's not clear whether this is a fact or an inference from Steve Thomas. If the number one clue that we all missed is this story about a bedtime story then what is the number two clue? Okay, so I'm not going to take it further than that. Um, I will be doing another live discussion on the transcript in the Caitlin Armstrong case dealing with Colin Strickland. So look out for that. Thank you for listening and I'll see you guys next time.